Amen. Like for every Moses, you know, there's a, there's a Joshua. For every Eli, you know, there, there, there's a, a Samuel. And, and, and even, you know, even for, for our, our walk and our, whatever ministry we have, God has someone ready, hopefully, to take that next step. Wherever, wherever we go, whatever happens. And God has prepared my nephew and our, our little brother in Christ, Christopher, amen. amen. And I'm just so thrilled to be here in the house of the Lord. And it's been, it's been a month since we've been here, consecutive weeks, but we're really happy to be here. Yeah. So we're going to go and open up our Bibles, and we're going to get into the Word of God. And today we're talking about a higher place of worship. Micah chapter 4, verse 2. Before I forget, life group this week, is it, is it going to be, is it going to be, it's going to be at the household, amen. Huh? At the beach? I'm sorry, you guys were at the beach this week. My bad. I was going to look at you and when Caleb nodded, I was like, yes, we're, we're thinking the same thing. All right, so this week, the young people want to go have a bonfire, it's probably going to be kind of a bonfire type of thing at the beach, and you guys will post the information online. On Instagram. Amen. Micah chapter 4 verse 2. It says, Many nations will come up and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain. Everyone say that. Come, come. Let, us go up let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. And it says, Continue saying, To the temple of the God of Jacob, He will teach us His ways so that we may walk in His paths. The law will go up, go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, before we thank you for this word. We thank you for your presence, for your anointing. We thank you for all you do for us. And there is no one like you. We ask you, Lord, that you would speak to us today. And that you would move in these services. And that you would continue to, Lord, move in a wonderful way. Lord, in our lives and everything that we do, may we glorify you. Because of your strength, because of your anointing, because of everything that you are and all, Lord Jesus, that you've done for us. May we, Lord, be driven to do these wonderful things. In Jesus' name we pray and we say... Amen. Take your seats, and let's go ahead and talk about worship today. All right, so the definition of worship. It is a feeling or expression. Everyone say expression. Expression. expression something that comes from us. It describes, it, it's, a, it's a show of what's inside of us already. But it's an expression of the highest level of respect. Worship isn't just a casual, a casual compliment, right? Or it's not something that's just done in passing. The, the definition of worship is something that we express that's of the highest level of respect. It also means a total devotion towards a person or principle. So you can worship not just a person, but you can also worship a principle. Well, a lot of people do in this life. But for us, this means that God wants all of us, and He wants to be number one in our life. Worship is honor given to someone in recognition of their merit. Everyone say merit. merit. So that means if you worship someone or something, you do it because you believe that they are worthy of it. And so for us, it means that we worship God because we believe that He is what? Worthy. Can everyone say, say worthy? Worthy. Say, the Lord is worthy. Say it one more time. Say, Jesus is worthy. Lift up your hands and say that this morning. Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy. It means that God deserves the best. Because we believe that he is the highest and he is the greatest. So now that we know what worship is, it brings us back to what we were doing here this morning. Because if you believe in God, it, believe, it means that you believe that God is a part of everything that you do and the purpose of, of, of that you have in your life. It means that we have a purpose and God is working out his purpose in us. So what we're doing here this morning is that we are worshiping God in an exclusive way, in a beautiful way. God has brought us here to worship him. And it's not a coincidence that we come together, it's not an accident that we come together and that we try to look nice and that we try to be you know, buttoned up and that we try to give God the best. We do this for a reason, for a purpose, and for something that is spectacular and wonderful. 
what we do here on Sunday, what we do here even on a Tuesday or Wednesday or in our own prayer closets, when we worship God, we do so with a purpose and we do so because we believe that he is worthy and that he is deserving of the highest praise. And there's a tradition in the word of God that God has always called his people to a higher place of worship. Worship isn't necessarily something that's static, that stays the same, but there's a gradual growth in the way that people have worshipped God. God invited his people to worship him on, on a mountain many times. And when you think about why, I started thinking about why, why would God bring his people to worship on a mountain? It could be that he wanted them to focus in a place away from distractions. Maybe the beautiful scenery reminded them that God is the creator of all things, of the whole world. It, all, it could also be that climbing up the mountain made them real, realize that God was above everything. If you ever go on a hike or if you go on a trek up a mountain and you can look down at everything, it makes you realize how small you are and how beautiful God's creation is and how powerful and wonderful He is. You can go on top of that mountain and realize that there is something in this universe that is of a higher power, of a higher intelligence, and of a higher ability than any man, than any nation, than any scientist, than any corporation. And you realize that our God is a God of order, and a God of power, and a God of love, and that's why we are called to worship Him in an extraordinary way. That's why you and I are here, sitting here today, maybe with our hands lifted, maybe raised in our voices because we deserve that God is worthy of a higher praise of a higher worship. Some people believe that there was a random amount of gas and elements that came together and created the universe. People say that there was a big bang. People believe that, they, that, that there was something accidental that happened, but you and I believe that God is a God of precision and a God of purpose and a God of power. So we believe that God spoke and bang, everything came into existence. He spoke and there was light. Our God doesn't even have to lift a finger. He can speak things into existence. He can will things into existence. And we deserve, we need to give him all the honor and glory because he's deserving of a higher worship today. We need to be excited to worship God. We have to be excited to worship our creator. In the book of Exodus, God called out to Moses while he sat on Mount Horeb. And God told Moses he was going to use him to free his people from slavery. The Bible says that Moses was a little scared at first and not sure about the whole thing. But God, God tells Moses, he says, tell Pharaoh that I, that I, I am who I am sent you. And what God was doing, and when, every time you read the word of God, you, you, you see different things, different angles, right, of, of the word of God. And so what God was doing, he was announcing himself. He was reintroducing himself to the, to, to the descendants of, of Abraham. But he was also announcing himself to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. You know, the Egyptians had over 2,000 gods. They believed that there was a god of like the countryside, the god of the ocean, and the god that was uh, of the sun and the moon, and a god of the caves, and a god of the underworld. But what God was saying to Pharaoh and to all the people in that land, he's saying, you might believe that your gods have power, but I'm trying to tell you, I want to announce to you today that I am who I am. You don't have to worship 2,000 gods, but I am the self-existing God. I am the God forever. I am Jehovah the Lord. I am Jehovah God, and that God that revealed himself to Moses is the same God that you and I serve today. So that's why God is calling us to a higher place of worship, to a higher place, hallelujah, in our daily lives. And he says to Moses, I'm going to show you a sign. I'm going to, give, I'm going to, I'm going to speak to you this truth. Soon you're going to see and hear and know and experience that I am God and I don't need anyone's help. I wasn't created by human hands. I am the first and I am the last. I am God. In Exodus, in Exodus chapter 3, 2, he says that God said, I will be with you and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. 
And when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. God is saying, I'm going to do it for you. And once you see it, you're going to worship me here on this higher place. The Bible says that God called Abraham to worship him several times. And one of the greatest examples of worship in Abraham's life was when Jehovah called him up to Mount Moriah to test his faith. He told Abraham to travel up to the mountain to offer his only son as a sacrifice. And for most of his life, Abraham couldn't have a son. He and his wife prayed about it, and they even tried hacking the system, right? They tried cheating their way into a blessing. But what we, we, what we realize in the Word of God is that you, there, is, there are no shortcuts to blessings. You can't microwave your way into a blessing. It has to be on God's time. It has to be God's perfect will. And the Bible says that Abraham finally received his son. Him and his, his wife Sarah received their son. But now God was telling him to offer his son as a sacrifice. So the two, um, the two went along with Abraham's servants. And they went on to a journey to Mount Moriah. But when they get close to the mountain, he tells the servants, wait here. My son and I are going to offer a sacrifice, and then we're going to return. So there was something inside Abraham that believed that somehow, some way, God was going to return to him his son. And so the Bible says that Abraham didn't completely understand what was going on, but he put his faith to work and in Jehovah God. Isaac was already a big boy. He was probably around 13, maybe 12, 13, around that age. So Abraham, the Bible says that Abraham and his son were going on this journey. His son says, Dad, I see everything that you need for a sacrifice except for one thing. Where is the sacrifice? And, and Abraham tells his son, don't worry, son. Jehovah, God, is going to provide a sacrifice himself. Right? That's powerful. God himself is going to provide a sacrifice so the Bible says he builds an altar and he puts wood on top of it and he ties up his son and puts him on it. I love how the Bible gives us that, 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 that picture, right? The Bible says that he builds God an altar. He builds God, he builds the Lord an altar. You and I have to build God an altar. We have to have an order of worship in our lives. We have to have a time and a moment, a place perhaps we have to have a mindset. We have to have a, a complete opening in our minds and our hearts where we can worship God freely. The Bible says that, that Abraham was willing to worship God completely in this instance. The Bible says he puts everything in place. He gets his knife out. But the Bible says in Genesis 22, verse 12 through 14, the angel stops him and says, Do not let him, the boy, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up there in a thicket and saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. Can you say it with me? The Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on that mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. He declared that Jehovah Jireh was the one that would provide all things. So you and I, when we go in the place of worship, we worship the one that will provide all things. The one who has provided all things. The one who has given us all things. We worship him because he is good, yes, but we also worship him because we know what he's done and what he's doing and what he's going to do. The Lord provides. The Lord provides. The Lord provides all things. God called Abraham to a higher place of worship, number one. But Abraham answered the call and he made an effort to pursue the Lord exclusively in that place. God will many times call us to worship Him and a lot of us will put that call directly to voicemail. God will text us. God will send us an email. And a lot of times we'll ignore it. God will knock on our door and we'll tell God we're not ready for you right now. But when God asks us to worship Him, and He calls us, and He actually expects us to worship Him, 
We have to answer that call, young people, brother, sister. We have to answer that call. When God calls us, we have to set out to go wherever he calls us to. It could be a place within your home. It doesn't have to be a mountain site or a campsite. But you have to find a way to worship him in a time, in a manner where you can focus on him and him alone. It's really important that we aren't trapped into the habits of everyday life when it comes to worship. I know that when we study, some of you guys, you watch the TV, you have your phone with you, and that might work for when you study, and if you're getting good grades, I can't tell you that you're doing the wrong thing. But when it's time to worship God, we have to find a way to block everything out. And it could be literally that you go into a closet, like Jesus says. You go into a closet that maybe you share a room with your brothers and sisters, so you don't have your own room, you don't have your own space, and that's understandable. But God is calling us to a place where we can just be there alone with Him. Where we can offer the best that we have alone with Him. I think it's interesting that Abraham left behind his, his servants. I think it's interesting that when God called Moses, it was just him and the sheep. I think it's powerful when God calls out to us that he wants us alone with him. He wants us to be alone with our thoughts, alone with our needs, alone with our necessities, alone perhaps with your anxieties. But God wants one thing. He wants you and all of you. He wants you and all that you can offer him. So I'm asking you today, will you answer the call of worship? Because God is calling you to worship today. Abraham answered the call. Jehovah provided the sacrifice. Then Je Abraham knew Jehovah in a new way. And that's what we do. We, we realize that Jehovah provides us so many new things to us. And we know him in a deeper and a newer way. Oftentimes in our lives. Of course, this is a preview of, of what Jesus was going to do for us when he sacrificed his life for our sins. He became a sacrifice for us. The Lord himself provided us a sacrifice for our sins. Second example we're going to look up at really quickly was one, is one of my favorite stories, or one of the favorite stories that is found in the Bible. The pastor read me this story when I was eight years old. Uh, when we went camping in an RV, me and my family, Janelle wasn't there yet, so it was a little bit more quiet in that RV. My dad took us out camping, and there at the, near the, uh, I think it was, I don't think it was a fire going, but there in the wood, near the fireside, he read us a story, it was about, it was about Elijah. And Elijah, the, the thing that I think is so funny is that he wasn't a guy that he used a lot of words. He was very direct with his language. He got straight to the point. He said what needed to be said. In the book of Kings, there was a wicked king named Ahab who had a wicked wife named Jezebel. The two turned to false gods and they turned away from God. And they killed all the prophets and only listened to the, to the they killed all the prophets and only listened to the false prophets. And Elijah was powerfully used by God. He was moved up by the Holy Spirit to challenge all the false prophets to a contest to see whose God was real. So he gets all these prophets on Mount Carmel and he tells them, okay, we're going to have a contest. You're going you're gonna to worship your God and I'm going to worship my God. Whichever God answers by fire, that's going to be the real God. Is that simple to you guys? You guys can do that? You guys think you, you can figure that out? They said, yeah, we're going to do it. So the Bible says that there were 450 false prophets and there was only Elijah, 450 to 1. <laughs> These men got together and they, they cried out to their God for hours and hours. They even hurt themselves doing so. They got their bull, they put it on their altar, and they were making a loud noise. And the Bible says that Elijah had fun with it. He started telling them, maybe your God's on vacation. Maybe your God is deep in thought. Maybe your God is asleep. Get louder. But nothing happened. They tried for hours and hours and hours and no one answered. They're completely exhausted. Elijah says, hey, you guys had your chance. Now it's my turn. The Bible says the first thing he does is he repairs the altar. You know, I think that sometimes we are inconsistent in our lives, and that's just part of life, right? Some of you, 
You might have had a change in your life, you had a new job, start up a few months ago, your school schedule changes, so you haven't been praying the way that you should be. You know, it's never too late to repair the altar in your life. You can get that couch ready again. You can get that bedside ready again. You can put your music on and you can always start to pray again before God. And you know the beautiful thing about God is that any time that someone approaches the Lord with reverence and humility, accepting His Word, God will never turn someone away. So we can have the confidence to go before God. It could, it could be a month since the last time you prayed. It could even have been a year since the last time you prayed at home. You can go before God today, friend, brother, or sister. You can go home. You can go into your closet. You can go on your bedside. There you can reach out to God and begin to worship Him. And our God is going to do something in your life. Our God is going to answer your prayers because He's a good God. Because He's a loving God and He's a faithful God. Beyond faithful is our God. The Bible says he prepares the altar. The Bible says that he makes a simple prayer. And he says, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He calls out to who God is. And if you've grown up in church, maybe your parents love the Lord and they've grown up in church, it's beautiful to do that and say, God, you're the God that's been faithful to my father, my grandfather, and his father. God, you're the God that's been faithful to my wife and my children. God, you're the God that has taken me out of sin, taken me out of stress, and taken me out of a bad situation. You can begin to talk about God's faithfulness. God, you're the same God that gave me a job. You're the same God that saved me from an accident. You're the same God that gave me food when I was hungry. You're the same God that answered my prayers last week and the year before that and years before that. Begin to speak about God's faithfulness and who God is in your life the Bible says that he calls out to God he says God you are the God of, of you are the God of, of days past he calls out to God amen the Bible says though before I get ahead of myself he, he, he repairs the altar he dug around the stones and he made a circle he put wood in the middle cut the bull into pieces and here's a ridiculous part he wet the sacrifice and the reason why that's so powerful is that when this happened there was a drought in the land so that water was extremely valuable extremely valuable and the Bible says that he wet the sacrifice to a point that it was drenched all that the bloody parts of the bull were drenched but Elijah was, was, was declaring something here he's saying I'm going to offer something valuable to God with the water, but I'm also going to wet the sacrifice to the point that if this thing burns, it can't be a regular fire. It has to be a supernatural fire. You and I don't rely on a regular fire. We don't rely on a campfire. We don't rely on an electric fire. We rely on supernatural fire. Our God answers from heaven with supernatural works. Does someone know what I'm talking about today? Our God answers in fire. The Bible says that he put everything in order and he calls out to God. He says, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel. That you are God not just right here, not just over there, but you are God all around. You are the only God and that I am your servant and I've done these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you're turning their hearts back again. And the Bible says that fire came down from heaven. It burned up that drenched sacrifice. The wood and the stones and the soil and everything was consumed with fire. And when everyone saw this, the Bible says they cried out, oh my God, they fell on their knees and on their face. They said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Can someone say with me today, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. He set fire down. He answered the prayer of Elijah. And what Elijah did was he gave a proper worship. He gave a proper type of worship to God. 
the only true God. He showed that he understood how great God was by fixing up the altar, and then he brought in a nice big bull. He brought in a sacrifice. He worshiped God with all of his heart and confessed who God was, and God answered. He showed faith in God. He demonstrated obedience to God, and God answered. How many of you believe that we serve the same God of Elijah? Amen. How many of you believe that we serve the same God of Elijah? I believe that we have. We are serve the same God. When we get together to worship God, it should be a tremendous experience. It should be an honorable and, res and respectful experience that we give to God. And we should know that anytime we worship God, that He is prepared to move. And I believe that He's prepared to move this morning. And very quickly, I want to remind you guys, especially the juniors, the young people, there's so many different ways of worshiping God. But one of the greatest ways that we can worship God is by honoring all of our love, honoring Him with the way that we live. Amen? We live in a way that pleases Him, in the way that we honor our parents, the way that we read the Word, by staying away from sin, by being a witness, by offering a true sacrifice to Him, fasting and praying and giving up relationships that don't honor Him, giving Him even our tithes the way that we show faith in God. We can also give offerings and donations to the needy. We can lift up our hands by showing God that we need Him in our lives more than anything else. When we lift up our hands, we're not copying the MC, we're not copying anyone around us, but we're stretching out our hands to show God that we need Him, that we are lost without Him, that we are guilty, that we are sinners without, without hope without Him. But when we reach out our hands to Him, we know that He's going to respond. When I, when I reach out my hands in my soul, in my heart, I'm saying, God, I need you more than anything right now. I just want to get a hold of you. I just want to talk to you because I know that you alone are God. We show Him our desire. Sometimes we can even celebrate his greatness. We clap our hands. The psalm that talks about clapping, the, the clapping our hands. We clap our hands to celebrate the greatness of God. We get excited that his presence is here. We get excited that our God is awesome, that our God is powerful. We clap our hands because God is good. Can someone clap their hands this morning for just a moment? Because God is great. Sometimes we bow our heads in a reverence because we are so overwhelmed with his power and his graciousness in our lives. We show respect for him sometimes when we fall on our faces. We kneel down sometimes to show him that we give him honor and that it isn't about us, it's about who he is. That we have nothing good in us, it's all about what he's done in us. One of the most awesome ways to worship God is declaring who he is with our lips. That he's the all-powerful God, that there's no one else. That he is our Savior, our Redeemer, the one that cleanses us. He's our King. He's our Creator, our Provider. And at that point, we worship him. We should just welcome him in our hearts over and over and over again. And the most important thing for me when I worship is for me to, to never pretend with God. We have to be real with God. Can anyone say amen? amen. Don't try to be too, just too, sometimes you don't have to be too buttoned up or too cool if you're around other juniors or other young people. We don't try to impress anyone. We just focus on God. Amen. Cry a little bit. Sometimes we cry so much that you know the, the, the vocals start to flow a little bit. But we do it because we're so in love with Jesus that we don't care about how we look. We don't care about who's around. It's our job as worshipers to pursue him and experience a life with Jesus in prayer. It's our job for us to leave some things behind when we go up to that mountain and worship. We leave our thoughts behind, our doubts behind, our devices behind, even some conversations behind. And as we grow in the Lord, there are certain things that stay behind us forever. There are certain relationships that stay behind us. There are certain types of things and bad habits that stay behind us. Because when God calls you to a higher place, it's always worth it.